Approximately 30% of all boating accidents are caused by alcohol use. The TWRA makes it a top priority to get intoxicated boat operators off the water. Alcohol and boating do not mix. Always choose a designated boat operator. This week on Tennessee Outdoor Journal, we'll start off with scouting for success. Rubs, scrapes, food and water, and bedding cover. Next up, Archery 101, sighting in a bow. Move that sight housing down. So you're in quite a bit high there, it looks like. And we'll finish off with a drop the tailgate at Cumberland River Cleanup. Just told them they have a vehicle in the water. They're more than willing to pull it for free, carry it off for free. Tennessee Outdoor Journal is opening the cover and inviting you in for some outdoor tips, tricks, and behind the scenes look at the work being done by your Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Let's turn the page. What kind of legacy will we leave when our days upon this earth are gone? Tell me who will carry on This work that we've begun Care enough to be the keeper of the dream Thanks for joining us on this episode of Tennessee Outdoor Journal. A big part of deer hunting is being able to identify where deer are in your area. And it can be like finding a needle in a haystack unless you know a few simple signs to look for. Rubs, scrapes, food and water, and bedding cover. Those are the things that you need to identify on your hunting property. Bucks use their antlers to make rubs on trees as they travel through their home range, usually from feeding to bedding areas. Prior to the rut, lines of these rubs can be used as an indicator of where this buck is traveling. A scrape is where deer paw the ground, creating an area of bare dirt. Usually there will be an overhanging limb and they will lick that limb or rub their antlers in it. Scent is deposited in this location through urine and scent glands. And it is a good indication of deer activity leading into the rut. These areas are also good sites to set up a trail camera to see what might be in your area. Acorns, clover, persimmons, soybean, corn. Deer eat a variety of different things during the year. Once you identify a food source, you have to determine whether or not the animals are actually using it. So look for deer tracks, deer droppings. If you're seeing some of that, you may want to set up a trail camera. A trail camera can tell you what animals are coming in there. Are they bucks, are they does? And what times of day they're coming in and out of that food source. Thick cover generally means safety and bedding for deer. Look for a combination of trails, rubs, and cover to identify a possible bedding area. Combine that area with a nearby food source and you've identified a good place to hunt. Boots on the ground is the best way to know what deer are doing where you hunt. But keep in mind, patterns change. Never stop scouting. Always look for new sign and you'll be able to put together the puzzle to deer hunting success. Hey, this is Michael Parsley again uh, here at the Archery Den. Uh, we are continuing in our Archery 101 uh, segment and now we're gonna talk about uh, bow sites. Uh, Matt, uh, you've explained a lot today about uh, about bows and, and, and arrows and things that we're, we need for this fall. Uh, help us out on sites. Well really there's two and a half different kinds of sites on the market. Uh, one you have your simple fixed pin site. Um, this one is the spot hog hog father. So like I said this is a one pin fixed pin site. However we site this site in and we're going to set it for 20 yards. Once we get our sight tape in, there's a shoot-in process. This tape is ready to shoot anywhere from 20 to 100 yards. So we would simply dial our sight up to our 20-yard mark, 
and then when we're ready to go shoot at any distance, you can dial this thing, micro tune it into 52 yards if that's your shot. The second sight here is your fixed pin sight. So here I have four fixed pins. You can set these pins really for whatever you would like. I prefer to set mine 20, 30, 40, 50. And that way there's no confusion in the woods. I have forgot, I shot a one pin sight years ago, forgot to move it and I missed a deer by a mile. Um, that one pin just got me, I put the pin on the deer and it was not the distance I needed. With this four pin sight when I draw back my brain grabs that there's four pins there and I have to pick one. It may not be the right one but I gotta pick one and make sure that I know my yardage. Um, the other half a sight is this is a fixed sight but it can also be moved. So right here we would have this sight set 20, 30, 40, 50. If you're on an elk hunt out west, you may want to shoot an 80 yard shot. A lot of guides will say, hey, that may be as close as we're gonna get, and you gotta shoot 80. In this instance, what I would do is move that sight housing down. The bottom pin then becomes your floater, and it will move from 50 yards to 80 yards and let you take that shot. It gives you the flexibility of having fixed pins not getting, uh, not forgetting to move your sight, but it also allows you to extend your distance without having seven, eight, nine pins on there to get confused and having to count. Okay, and so we have two and a half styles of, of actual sights that go on bows, and when someone comes in, either buying a new bow mm -hmm. or wants a new sight for their own uh, bow, you can set them up with either because we, they're both interchangeable. Right? We can go either way. This this site, uh, they can buy this site, upgrade the site on their bow, or uh, if they upgrade bows, they can take this site with them. But we've got many different styles. Some people are not comfortable with three, four, and five pins. They're afraid they're gonna get confused. We just go with a one pin, but there's some guys who don't want that one pin, and uh, we've got options to let them shoot fixed and also shoot long distance with a fixed pin sight. All right, so uh, that's uh, that's sights in a nutshell. Uh, I've brought my bow today, and it's got a spot hog on it. Maybe you can help me sight mine in. Absolutely, let's do it. Okay. All right, now we're in, uh, in the archery den's archery range, and we're going to sight this bow in. This is my bow. I've, I've never shot this bow, and it's a new sight. So uh, we're going to shoot it, see how far it's off, and then Matt, is going to help us sight this bow in today. All right, Matt. Perfect, Michael. So you're hitting quite a bit high there, it looks like. So the most important thing to remember when sighting in your bow is chase the arrow. You always want to move the sight in the direction that the arrow is hitting. For instance, Michael just hit pretty high. If you're hitting high, you're gonna move the sight up. So what we want first off is we kinda of want our pins centered in our sight here. We want that 20 yard pin centered somewhere in the middle. And then we're gonna bump the housing When you say you're bumping the housing up, that just allows you to bring the pins up and keep them in the center of the housing. That's right. Okay. Um, so we want those pins in the center of the housing, and then by getting that housing all the way up, uh, that also keeps the housing in the center of the site. And I think we're just playing a guessing game here. Sometimes it takes several shots to get your bow sighted in. Um, there's no real quick and easy way to do it. It's all about shooting the bow, but the good thing is shooting the bow, that's part of the game.
That's pretty good. I would say that you're <laughs> That's there. That's pretty good. <laughs> All right. Well, clearly the archery den can help you sight in your bow. He did it in uh, 30 seconds. So uh, come on out. They'll help you. They'll, they'll get your bow right. Uh, they'll help you find the correct bow. And then they'll help you uh, sight it in. That was perfect. I'm Brad Miller, Elk Program Leader for TWRA. Did you know we have a great place to come see elk in Tennessee? We're here at the Hatfield Knob Elk Viewing Tower. It's in just north of La Follette, Tennessee. It's a place where you can park and have a, a short half mile walk on a gravel road and a tower that overlooks about a 30 acre field. Elk are out generally in mornings and evenings, but it's a great place to come see all types of wildlife. We have turkeys, the occasional bear rolls through, so it's just a great place to come out and spend an afternoon and enjoy Tennessee's wildlife. Thank you everybody for tuning in for another Drop the Tailgate. I'm Barry Cross, the Region 2 Communications Coordinator. And today we're out at the Cumberland River, right at Opryland. And uh, we've got a group called Adventures with Purpose who are an environmental group of divers that are doing a river cleanup and the TWRA is here assisting them. And Matt Norman, our Davidson County officer, was instrumental in getting this partnership going. And Matt, um, just tell me a little bit about how this all came about. Yeah, absolutely. So I actually have been watching Jared's channel for uh, quite a little bit. Um, uh, in one of his videos, they mentioned that they were coming to Tennessee. I didn't know where they were coming to Tennessee. I didn't know they were coming to Nashville. Um, so I reached out to him and just said, if you're going to be anywhere around Nashville, um, I'd love to come out and just uh, observe, be available to offer any connections that I can make between uh, his group and the, the local, uh, you know, authorities, run tags for them if they pull anything out and that kind of thing. And uh, it just worked out they were in Nashville and uh, reached out to Jared. He emailed me back right, up, right away, um, told me where they were going to be at. I came out and kind of just observed and ran some, a, a couple of tags for them when they were down there. Um, made the calls to all of Metro Police, Metro Park Police, um, Metro OEM, those, those kinds of contacts and just told them they have a vehicle in the water, they're more than willing to pull it for free, carry it off for free, just you know we just want to make sure that that's fine with them. Of course they were more than happy with that as long as it didn't get left on the on the boat ramp and <laughs> made those calls and um, that's that's how it went. And Jared Jared Lysick. Jared Lysick. Yes, sir. You, you are uh, the owner, the founder of Adventures with Purpose. Yes, sir. Now, explain to me what Adventures with Purpose is and where are you guys from? Adventures with Purpose has really turned into so many things to so many people, and we can dig deeper into that as you know our little conversation goes along here. But we're out of Oregon, and Adventures with Purpose really started with just you know myself, my wife, and my daughter Kiki, the camera girl. <laughs> you know, she's one of those people that likes to be behind the camera, and the only thing that you would ever see from her is she'd wave, give a thumbs up, or you know when I tell stupid dad jokes, a lot of thumbs down on the show. Yeah. And it really started as a midlife crisis of. I didn't want to deal with clients anymore. I had a buddy that was doing YouTube who was actually doing it full time and he says, Jared, you're great behind the camera producing shows. You need to get out from behind the camera and you need, you need to get in front of it. So here we are. We're now in front of the camera. Over 250, I think close to 300 episodes now. And it really started as, like I said, the underwater environmental cleanup of, hey, let's set a goal of cleaning up 2,000 pounds of you know, garbage and debris out of our local river in Bend, Oregon and see if we can do that in 90 days. It only took us three three weeks to do so. And then from there, it just kind of snowballed from there. I started that in July of 2018. By February of 2019, I accidentally ran into my first car. It was up in Portland, Oregon, just on a regular river river cleanup dive like we'd been doing. And so I contacted the, you know, the local authorities up there in Portland and the parks and rec, and I said, hey, you know, we found a vehicle. What can we do to get it out? It's a closed boat route. They said, there's nothing you can do. It's a closed boat ramp. You cannot have access to it. And, well, in my world, you know, I, I always find a way. 
And so for me, as a diver, we carry 50 pound lift bags with us all the time. And so all we need, we just need bigger lift bags. If I can float an entire car and move it down river a mile to a public boat ramp, I'm taking this thing out of a public boat ramp. So there we go. That's kind of how we started floating cars. Uh, but you know, it was only supposed to be the one car. When we went in for that one car, we accidentally ran into two more cars. When we went in for one of those cars, we accidentally ran into two or three more cars. And this is just all, you know, in murky waters with us diving, bumping into these by accident. And so, anyways, we started, you know, acquiring better, you know, technology such as the side scan sonar and what's, you know, some of the best that's out there. And, you know, you guys are in some of the same units. Mm -hmm. And so we started looking for these at closed boat ramps, at open boat ramps, you know, and across, you know, so we kind of started figuring out a car can float for two to 10 minutes, you know, a car will float in the river, but once it goes in and it settles in, floods can come through, you know, for the next 30 years and these cars do not move because they are stuck there. So anyway, so that's kind of how this whole thing started. But then it kind of moved into, how far do you want me to go, Barry? Yeah, you're, you're uh, good right there. Uh, let's, let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about the last couple of days here. I mean, you've obviously bumped into a few cars. Yeah, I would say we got, uh, I mean, more, I had more fingers than I have for yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, is it difficult for you as, as a, you said, crew of three to come out and get these cars out? You know, honestly, this is no longer a crew of three. You know, I've, for the last year, I've said, you know, AWP is no longer just two guys or my wife and my daughter. I mean, AWP, Adventure with Purpose, has really turned into an entire movement because Matt reached out, you're here. I mean, your entire organization, all the volunteers that you, you know, have, have come out, the viewers on Facebook, the viewers on YouTube, the Adventures with Purpose has now become, what does that purpose mean to the viewers? What does it mean to those that come out and volunteer? For some, it means, Jared, and we'll get into this more later, but you know, some of them are like, Jared, you saved my life. Or Jared, you've now given me purpose. Jared, you've made me realize that, you know, there's still faith in humanity. So it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. When I was down there the other day and you're pulling a car out, uh, I saw divers everywhere. Are these people that you knew or? Everybody is volunteer. With 18 million viewers a month, people just like Matt reach out and say, we see what you're doing, we love what you're doing, we want to be a part of it. And with Matt, I got to give him a little bit of credit here, and partly because I think that he ended up seeing an episode where we had a little difficulty with local law enforcement, where we just immediately they come down and they just butted heads with us, and we offered up our services, we're here to help out, hey, we've located this, because we were actually looking for, a, you know, working on a cold case, we located the vehicle, and now for us, we don't worry about the, you know, the who done it or the story behind it to solve it. We worry about the where. And so that's what we do is we come in, we do, we identify the where when it's dealing with cold cases or if it happens to be we're looking for a specific vehicle, you know, that might be stolen. So that's kind of where we're at. And, you know, with Matt, I appreciate him reaching out that says, yes, we would love to show you Nashville hosp hospitality if you're coming through Nashville. So I really appreciate that as Matt and other agencies see what it is that we're doing, that they say, oh yeah, we don't need to be threatened by Adventure with Purpose or their volunteer network that they have, that they're out here doing something good for the environment. And we also see that if they do locate something that is a crime scene, that they know exactly what to do, that it's hands off, here it is, what can we do to help you out? Our boating officer over here, Josh Landrum, uh, I was talking to Jared earlier, they've got a lot of high-tech equipment mm -hmm. that they use but we've got our own high-tech equipment with uh, the agency, and that's a ROV. Can you explain a little bit about what our equipment is and what it does? Yes, uh, so we have an ROV, uh, which is a remote-operated vehicle. So the best way to describe it, it's a small, submersible submarine uh, that has equipment on it, such as high-definition cameras and sonar that we can put into the water and uh, we use it for boating investigations, uh, body recovery, evidence recovery. We've also used it for automobile recovery across the state. So when uh, Officer Norman reached out to the boating division and told us about uh, what they do and what they're going to come here to the Cumberland River to do, we knew that you know that ROV could come in uh, great use for them and you know for us to get some time out here on the water with it and uh, try to locate some of these vehicles. 
and you did. I, I was watching the monitor. You you were going down through there, identifying Oop. numbers of vehicles as you went <laughs> down. And for me, it was hard to really understand what was going on on that screen. Uh, it's almost like if you were flying uh, by instruments only. You know, you couldn't see. Oop. Um, explain what you're looking at on that screen while you're operating. Yeah, when we put the ROV in the water, we're looking at a computer screen that has the sonar image and it's also got that uh, video image. And you know, in, in the waterways, a lot of times they're murky. So we're really using that sonar quite a bit. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, what we call stick time, a lot of time, you know, uh, practicing with it. And that's one thing that we did uh, this week with it. You know, it gave us an opportunity to put it in the water and to get some more experience uh, using our equipment. We have uh, two ROVs that we have statewide. We purchased our first one in 2012, then we purchased a second one in 2018. Uh, we were fortunate enough that both of those ROVs were purchased with a port security grant that we were able to obtain uh, to get those ROVs. And uh, that those grants, without those grants, you know, purchasing those that type of equipment is very expensive, and we might not have been able to get it if it wasn't for the port security grant. And uh, with that, we. Uh, used that ROV to assist other agencies. We've assisted uh, the FBI, we've assisted the TBI, uh, we've assisted national parks. Uh, so anytime they need it for any type of their investigations, we'll come out and uh, we'll you know offer up our services to them and to help them with whatever evidence they're trying to find. And uh, one other thing, I, when I was looking at the screen, I see uh, an object, I can't tell what it is. Uh, does it really, click with you whenever you see something on the bottom you like, I know what that is. Yeah, you know, it takes a lot of practice to know what you're looking at on the sonar image, um, see what type of shadows are getting thrown out there. This uh, ROV that we have is very high tech and those images show up pretty clearly sometimes. Uh, just like these vehicles, they show up sometimes looking like a vehicle on that sonar image screen because the sonar is so good and so high tech for us. So, but it does take some, uh, lot, lots of practice in uh, knowing what you're looking at. And Jared, uh, I'm going to finish up with you. Uh, you're in Nashville, but uh, the cold case is what brought you to Nashville, right? Yeah. And uh, that is turned into something that's a, a little more a little more than you thought it would be uh, you're, you're actually getting people uh, reaching out to you this really turned into a mission to serve that came out of nowhere you know again it, we're following the midlife crisis of you know a new chapter in my life that my children are now you know 20 and 23 and you know what am I going to do go do and like I said, you know, it kind of started off with a, hey, let's get in the water and become a middle-aged YouTuber. <laughs> but then it became a, the environmental portion of it. Then it came into the bigger environmental portion of it. But here's where it triggered, though, is that, like I said, we have 18 million people a month that are watching us. And a lot of those said, you know what, Jared? We know of a family that needs answers. They have a missing lost loved one, and the vehicle is also missing. And Jared, we know that there's also a cell phone ping that last pinged near the river. Can you come and identify if by chance they ended up in the water? Because they know that one, we can identify vehicles underwater, but then two, they also know that we have the ability and the proper tools to remove these vehicles from underwater. You know, and, and we often get the question of, you know, why isn't the local agencies doing enough? You know, and, and we don't throw them under the bus because here's what we want the viewers to understand. We want them to understand that not every agency has a dive team. Not every agency has the finances to, you know, move vehicles and, and get those out of the water. But then in addition to that, a lot of the agencies, they have, you know, 30 new caseloads a day, you know, that, that come in depending on what, you know, where you're at across the U.S. Some may only have, you know, four or five a week. But the thing is, is now a year passes. Now, you know, we have another 60 to 100 to, you know, 1,000 plus cases that some of them just kind of get put on the back burner because we have no more leads. But for us, we're able to come in, take this information from the family, from news reports, from other witnesses and say, you know what? If it's water related, if it's vehicle related, we're going to do everything we can to jump in the water and check it out. And it's kind of, and it's really turned into what we refer to as an open source investigation because for a couple of reasons. One is we are making it aware, you know, making the public aware of what it is that we do because we do document everything 
and we work with a lot of these families which is really you know kind of a tough thing to do because if we become emotionally invested with them and they allow us to do so knowing that with their story being told that we can then you know potentially help another family that was never aware of what it is that we can do so for that we really appreciate them you know some of these cases we come in we've been able to solve them in you know 30 minutes for to locate the where some of them we posted our video and then and, and we did not find anything but then somebody says I have that one puzzle piece that you're looking for you need to come back and you need to check out this one mm -hmm. and we've actually you know that's actually happened where we've gone back and 30 minutes later once we're back on the water you know we've been able to solve that cold case but then, you know and there's other ones where you know we you, you can't win them all as you know yeah, yeah. but we'll continue to you know spread the message that you know people have not forgotten about these families and if you have the ability to you know do your own investigation you know and get out there and help the family you know please do so well I appreciate you coming out and letting us talk to you and be a part of this uh, we appreciate your passion for the environment and uh, all this work that you've done to clean up uh, our, our river here in Tennessee. So yeah, uh, we hope uh, you get to come back sometime soon. Absolutely, and uh, I hear that you're gonna try to rush to get this uh, edited tonight. Gonna be on tonight. And if people see it tonight, we're gonna invite everybody out tomorrow from 10 to 2 here in Nashville at the Gaylord, Gaylord Opryland Pavilion. Come check it out. They have like a little loopy loo that you can drive around. And listen, they say that you're not supposed to get out of the car, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you want to get out of the car and you want to walk around these, I think you can probably get away with it. So anyway, we do invite you to come down, check it out, and if you've not checked out Adventure the Purpose, you mind if I just go ahead and plug this? Absolutely. Do check us out, because you know, it's without you, the viewers, supporting the ones that we're doing, we are 100% volunteer, and it's just those likes, it's those shares, it's the, you know, comment, comments, and the whole YouTube algorithms, the Facebook, that puts us out here because it's expensive. I cannot take it out of my pocket and do this. That's because the online world and the platform that we're able to make this work. So thank you very much. I think that's all we've got here from Opryland Hotel and Convention Center. Uh, we're right here on the Cumberland River. Uh, Jared Lysick, uh, Adventures with Purpose, is doing an environmental cleanup. And be sure to come out, check out these cars, and we'll see you next time on Drop the Tailgate. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Tennessee Outdoor Journal. We'll see you next time. Tennessee Outdoor Journal is produced by your Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Hi, I'm Charlie Daniels. So when I was a kid, I loved baseball and football and all kinds of stuff, but my favorite pastime was when my daddy would get me up early in the morning and we'd go hunting or fishing. Out in the fresh air, on the water, or back in the woods, and you learn a lot. You got kids, take them hunting, take them fishing. Join me, buy a hunting or fishing license. Let's keep wildlife in Tennessee. That's a doggone good thing. Buy your license today at GoOutdoorsTennessee.com.